Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see. Okay, so um, hi everybody. Um, so first, thank you to Anna for this invitation. She invited me like uh, almost two months ago. I was so so busy before to to give this talk, uh, but it's very exciting actually to share this uh, this work that we are doing is this ongoing effort to to deconstruct um, human metastasis by studying the brain metastasis. So I would like to start saying some few words about the problem actually. So so the problem is that more of 90% of the cancers that are associated with metastatic disease. So metastasis is the spread of can cancer cells from primary site to distant organs, right? For example, in this diagram, you can see a uh, breast cancer patient that disseminate the cancer disseminated to organ like a lungs, brain, liver, or, or bone. Um, and this statement that is in the title of this slide is very much the fierce statement that you read in any single paper in metastasis. So I want to show you some of the evidence that support this statement. So these are 22 um, data for the National Cancer Institute showing the five year survival in, in three cancers. Just I pick three cancers here, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer, and showing the prognosis of the patients with localized cancer. So just primary tumor without dissemination, regional dissemination, lymph nodes, or distant metastasis, right? Brain, lung. Uh, and you can see that in any cancer, the, uh, the prognosis really fall, drop very high in patients that they disseminate, right? So basically this is the problem actually that we have in the people that we work in cancer is that uh, metastasis is, uh, is a major cause of death and also how the prognosis is so low in this patient uh, that pose other challenges, logistic challenges to study metastasis. That is something that we're going to, to talk later on. So mechanistically, what we know about metastasis, this is mostly from experimental mouse model, is that the cancer cell to be successful in colonize a distant organ and generate a successful metastasis, they have to uh, have tumor initiating capacity, so the ability to form a new tumor. Um, it is suggested in experimental models that the cancer cell also they activate or they engage specific programs suited for that specific tissue that is being affected. That is the name, the expression of adaptive organ specific programs. And also we know that the cancer cell, they need to interact and, and, and create a new niche or a tumor microenvironment that we call metastatic niche, and the cancer cells interact with them in a way that actually all of these boost or generate a perfect storm to form a, a successful metastasis. Now, all of this is in experimental models. So what we don't know, or what we would like to know is that what is the nature or what form these programs takes in human metastasis? We want to know, for example, if there is a set of common um, traits that are conserved in different cancer that colonize a given organ. And I mostly want to know what makes a metastasis be successful, because we know that the cancer cells they can disseminate an organ, but not necessarily form a metastatic tumor. So they can stay dormant there, but then something happens that this cancer progress into a successful metastasis and over uh, a clinically detectable metastasis. Um, so I. I put this question here because all the analysis that I'm going to show in this presentation are associated with these three questions. Also, one of the major reasons that we don't really know that much about metastasis from human metastasis is because what I said before. So the prognosis in this patient is so low that getting, having access to this clinical sample is very challenging. Um, and the previous effort to understand metastasis have been using uh, bulk analysis so basically the whole tumor. And we know that the tumor is composed just by tumor cells, but also with other things. So it's, it's, it's very complex. It's difficult to study, meta, understand what the cancer cells are doing if we cannot really understand, study specifically cancer cell. So the model that I have been working since I came to UCSF to study metastasis is brain metastasis. Right? It's, it's the model that we use to deconstruct human metastasis. So some facts about um, brain metastasis between 20 to 40% of all cancer patients, they will develop eventually brain metastasis. That is 10 times more common than primary brain tumors. Uh, is the, the metastasis with worse prognosis and the cancer with high 
higher incidence of brain metastasis in their lung, breast, uh, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma. So she's in aware. She was my mentor. Uh, and the process that we used in this study was in collaboration with Joanna Phillips, um, working in, 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 with patients that were attended into the hospital at UCSF, uh, the collection of fresh human metastasis. And with this single certain cryptomics in, in the fresh tumor, right? So we include in this study uh, cancer from metastasis from different cancers. For example, we have melanoma, breast cancer, lung cancer, bearing cancer, colorectal, <clears throat> renal cell carcinoma, even we have a sarcoma included here. And the strategy for the analysis was single cell trachytomic analysis on metastatic tumor cells, trachytomic analysis in non malignant cells in the stroma and mass cytometry analysis in the immune compartment, right? So today, I'm going to just talk about the metastatic tumor cell that I think is the more interesting findings. And we're going to visit this uh, population that they are uh, infiltrated into the, the metastasis just in the context of what is happening with the cancer cells. OK, this table is showing you some uh, characteristic of the patient, including this study. I don't want to really confuse you with so many things. Just I want to tell you that in this study, we include three melanoma brain metastases, three breast cancer brain metastases, three lung, two variants, and we have some other ones. Uh, most of the tumor, they are located in the brain cortex. And at the moment of surgery, most of the patients don't really have any treatment to the brain metastasis itself, except two patients that receive gamma radiation some few days before the surgery. However, this is brain metastasis in an end stage of cancer progression. So most of the patients actually they have some previous treatment, right? So this is the background noise that we're going to see in this study, just because the nature of the sample that we are using, the, the, this patient, they have some uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy or the treatment uh, early on. So some of them, for example, these patients with ovarian cancer, they develop brain metastasis 14 years after uh, uh, diagnosis of primary tumors. So to give you an idea, uh, the dimension of the, the point that we are working here. So for the outline, um, the presentation is going to have four different concepts. So the first one is going to, I want to show you some uh, unbiased analysis to identify which programs are detected in metastatic cells and how these programs are conserved in different uh, metastases. Um, after that, we're going to analyze how these programs correlate with the composition of each one of these tumors in terms of immune or non-immune compartment. Also, we're going to interrogate how the experimental model, they succeed or not in recapitulate what we see in patients to see if the experimental mo model is valid to study what we are trying to model here. And the last question is going to be how the metastatic cells transit from the quiescent or no proliferating state to proliferation, right? So what you are seeing here is uh, 80,000 single cell trachytomics from 15 uh, human brain metastases. As you can see here, just very simple observation is that all the stromal cells, so the non-malignant cells, they cluster together independent of the primary tumor, right? So you see the nascent common cell here, endothelial cells, T cells, astrocytes, macrophages, and the metastatic cells. For each one of them, these MTCs means metastatic tumor cells, they form independent or discrete cluster in all the cases. So if we cluster just the stromal cells, this is the composition of the human brain metastasis in each. So it's composed by a big cloud of mesenchymal cells, endothelial cells, and a small cluster of astrocytes and, and immune cells, right? So we see three different uh, myelo clusters here, two macrophages, one dendritic cell, five different clusters of T cells, and two of B cells. Um, we're gonna come back to this data later on. <clears throat> what we are seeing here, um, our diffusion map of two cases, these are just metastatic tumor cells. This is one of the breast, uh, bre breast cancer brain metastases and one melanoma. Um, what I want to show you here is how heterogeneous is the, uh, how heterogeneous are these 
tumor cells in patients. As you can see here, that processes like a hypoxia, protein synthesis, proliferation, stress, um, inflammation, they are driving all this diversity of functional diversity that we see in, in, in these patients. This PCA is just a quantification of how heterogeneous are these tumor cell populations. Now, this is very striking when you then ask yourself is, how heterogeneous are the metastatic cells genetically? So previous studies trying to understand how many, how heterogeneous or homogeneous are the uh, um, metastatic cells, particularly in distant metastases like a brain, bone, or, or lung, have concluded using the exome sequencing that the metastases there form mostly by homogeneous or clonal population. Now we cannot really infer clonality by using single set tracheotomy, but we can infer copy number variations. So have an idea how heterogeneous it is at the composition of this tumor. What we saw here is actually that, is that in all the cases, with three exceptions, all the metastases, they are composed by homogeneous population. This is just estimation by the copy number variations. And we identify two subclones in three cases, one melanoma in this chromosome here, for example, this brain metastasis for this lung cancer patient and this colorectal. So high heterogeneity in tracheotome, low heterogeneity by, by genetics. Then we use this strategy that is a factorization method. So basically what we did here, we identify, uh, well, we reduce the expression of all the, of the genes into 10 different programs using this factorization. And then for each case, so we have 15 patients, we did a hierarchy of clustering to identify which of these programs they are conserved by similarity of the gene list, right? So by doing this, we identify a different programs, conserved program, or we call it here uh, meta programs. When we did the functional annotation using the top 50 gene of each one of these uh, meta program, what we see here is that all of these programs are associated with very specific cellular functions. For example, two programs that are associated with uh, proliferations protein synthesis, respond to stress, developmental processes, uh, spatial activity and uh, mRNA processing, ECM remodeling and EMT, and inflammatory response. We call these uh, metaprograms and these genes, we call them metagenes because they're highly concerned, most of them in different cases. Um, then what we did was we wanted to know how these programs are being co-expressed into each one of these metastases. What we see here is all of the A metaprogram, they fall into two categories. Or the cancer cells, by the expression of this program, they, they form what we call here in this paper and in the title of this presentation, two archetypes. We see those cancer cells, they are highly proliferating. They have a high expression of uh, P1 and P2, but also they highly correlate with P6, that is a plisosome. And they have low expression of program like a, inflammatory programs or ECM remodeling program, right? And on the other side, we see those cells that they have a high inflammatory score, high stress score, high protein synthesis, high ECM remodeling, but low uh, proliferation. And we see the same or the same conclusion when we plot <clears throat> by cancer type, uh, by specific and order the cell by a score. For example, in this plot here, you can see the cancer cells ordered by the P1 score. This is proliferation, right? So proliferating cells, low proliferation, and you can see how the other program fall into this uh, discontinuum. So the protein synthesis, they follow a negative correlation with proliferation. Now, what, what was actually a surprise for us, um, or inflammatory programs, they follow a positive correlation with protein synthesis and negative correlation with proliferation. So in summary, what we see is this. So we see two kinds of metastatic cells that are present in each one of these human metastases. One of them we call proliferative archetypes and the other one we call it inflammatory archetype. And the inflammatory archetype is characterized by high expression of protein synthesis, high expression of ECM remodeling, collagen biosynthesis uh, pretty much, and EMT genes and high stress. And the, in the other side, the proliferative one, they have a low expression of all these genes, but also they have a high expression of cell cycle and also splice or so. Now, how this finding 
fits with what we know about human metastasis. So if we go to this paper that was published in 2017 in Nature, um, <clears throat> by using tranquitome in bulk, they concluded something similar actually. They identified two kinds of human metastases. Human metastases, they are highly proliferative, and human metastases, they are rich in inflammatory genes. Uh, what we find, or we suggest here that this, this is true, and actually we identify that these two states, proliferation and inflammation, they coexist into each metastasis, and they are following an opposite correlation. Now, this is a frame, but using this frame, now we can interrogate a different question, right? So for example, one of the first question is, how the expression of these metaprograms correlate with the composition of the, uh, of the stroma? So what we, you are seeing here is the expression of the score of one of the program, in this case is the PA or inflammatory uh, program. And here is the composition of that metastasis in terms of immune cells or non-immune cells. And we clearly see that the acquisition of an inflammatory program in metastatic cells correlate with the increase in of inflammatory cells or immune cells into the metastasis. And we see the opposite correlation. We, we plot the uh, uh, proliferative score. Now, into the immune cell, we wanted to know if all the immune cells correlate with the acquisition of one of the archetypes or the other ones, or they are specific subtypes. So what you are seeing here, they are the same idea. So here is the expression in the metastatic tumor cell for the inflammatory score. And here is the composition of the immune fraction per each one of these metastases. So we have two macrophages cluster, one dendritic cells, five different T cell clusters, and two B cells. And I want just to want you to put their attention into these four clusters. For example, these are all T cells. And we can see here that those T cell clusters, the red ones, that they are enriched in activation marker or cytotoxin marker, they have a high correlation with high expression of inflammatory genes in metastatic tumor cell. And those T cell clusters, they have a high energic score, a low T cell or cytotoxic activation, they have the opposite correlation. It's not any kind of T cell, it's actually the cell state of those T cell, how these correlate. So in other words, context matter, right? So the cancer cells, they acquire a specific state or program according to the composition of the tumor cells into the neighborhood. The second question was, now that we have these metaprograms is, how the experimental mouse model actually can recapitulate what we see in patients, right? So this is a major question for us because as many of you, I have been working all my life with mice and always we are asking ourselves how representative is the model that we use for the disease that we want to study. So we use two models here. Both of, both of them, they are breast cancer models. And this one is particularly important because this is the gold standard for brain metastasis biology. Almost every major paper in, 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 in mechanistic paper in metastasis have been using the MDA and B31BR model, right? So we induce brain metastasis by intracardiac inoculation. We did single cell tracheotomics, and we sort the cancer cells, and then we did follow with the same strategy. What we saw here is that the, this model in particular, they reproduce some of the, some of the metaprograms that we see in patients, for example, uh, cell cycle protein synthesis, but we don't see some of the program that we see in patients, for example, we don't see a, a clear stress signature, we don't see an inflammatory program, we don't see an ECM remodeling EMT program in the way how we see it in patients. What you see here is just a correlation of what we believe is the functional equivalence of the mouse program in human, right? So this is developmental compared with the developmental in patients, the protein compared with the protein. Um, but we are missing some, some, some major program here. Now, this is an immune deficient system. Because it's an immune deficient system, the question is, what if we do the same using an immune sufficient system? So what we did here, we use a different model that is the 41 BR cells. The 41 that were selected to colonize the brain. Uh, we repeat the experiment we did intracardiac inoculations, and we repeat the same strategy. And, and the conclusion was similar. So we see some programs like a cell cycle, um, developmental programs. We don't see the inflammatory program still. We don't see the, uh, the stress program and we don't see the ECM remodeling program. 
Um, we did also some inflammatory, sorry, some immunofluorescence to see why we don't see inflammatory program in these models. What you are seeing here in red or oh, oh, purple, there are metastatic tumor cells in brain. This is the MDA and B231 model. And in green, the level of CD45 cells infiltrated in that lesions. And we don't see that many in this model. This is an immune deficient, but also we don't see that many infiltration of immune cells in, in the immune competent. Um, this is just a control showing uh, the, the immunofluorescence. So this is one problem that we have been discussing here with different faculties is the most of the mouse model of cancer biology, they are core models. So they, they don't really reproduce the level of immune infiltration that we see in patients. A metastasis is, is clearly not, 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 not the exception. Then the last question um, is, why do some metastatic cells proliferate and others do not proliferate? Um, this is a PCA embedding for these metastatic cells, and you can see they follow two uh, trajectories, inflammatory genes, proliferative genes, the same conclusion that we, that we got with the factorization method. Um, so in this heat map, we reconstruct the transition from quiescence to proliferation, but ordering the cells by cell cycle as well. So you can see all the cells, low cycling to high cycling, and we run a differential expression between cycling cell and non-cycling cell in each one of the cases, and then we identify the intercept, what genes are conserved into cycling versus non-cycling, and that's what you are seeing here. This is a common signature, a core signature that describes this transition. What we believe is all of these states, for example, cells, they are rich and rich in cell cycle genes and down regulation of all these genes, mostly genes associated with antigen presentation or interaction with immune cells or inflammatory response could represent an immune evasive state associated with the reactivation of this cell from quiescence. Um, in this idea, we analyze this bulk data set, so this bulk RNA-seq data set from using 868 human metastasis, um, and we plot the inferred number of Im fraction of immune cells in those tumor correlated with the expression of this gene list that we identify in this, um, this analysis. And we see here that those genes, they are down-regulated in cycling cells correlate with the high level of infiltration of immune cells. So in other words, what we are saying here is that we believe is the reactivation for quiescence and proliferation into the human metastasis correlate with an immune evasive state. We did some validation in a different cohort. Uh, we're standing here CD45 and chi 7 in metastasis that are poorly proliferative and highly proliferative. We included in this analysis three breast cancer, five lung and five melanoma, and the conclusion is the same. So basically what we are suggesting here that reactivation for proliferation and immune evasion, they can act together, but mechanistically, we don't know how this happened. That is something that we're trying to understand if these two uh, concepts are really connected here. Uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting because we really want to know what make a metastasis keep the balance into more proliferation and progression or less proliferation and indolent metastasis. Okay, so like a summary, in this study we identify, uh, we propose that there are eight different functional program or meta program that are conserved across different human metastases in different cancer. This A program, they delineate or they reveal two kinds of metastatic cells to archetype, one proliferative and the other one is inflammatory, that they coexist within each metastatic tumor. Um, the Metastatic cells, they are not proliferating. They get, they may get reprogrammed into a different state. And this state is enriched in ECN remodeling, increase of protein synthesis. We don't know how these processes are, are correlated. That is something that we are really working in that now. Uh, but we also know that the context is really important. So this cancer cell, they acquire in this new state, but we know that it's correlated how is the neighborhood, how the immune system around them, uh, what state they acquire is going to impact in the acquisition of these archetypes. Um, and what I said before, 
we suggest that there is a connection between immune escape, immune evasions, and proliferative reactivation in, in metastasis. I would like to finish with a very simple idea is that this is a paper from 2013. And I highlight what I want to share here that I've been suggested that in the same way that a normal tissue become a tumoral tissue by a specific mutation, it's been suggested that there must be a specific mutation that can explain the difference between metastatic versus non-metastatic tumor. Multiple papers have been hunting for this mutation, but still we don't know if there is no consensus if there is a specific set of mutations that can explain if the metastasis, if this cancer is going to be metastatic or non-metastatic. Now, if there is no, this is a hypothesis, if there is no metastasis driver mutations, then what is the nature of the cancer cell properties that enable metastasis in patients? What, what, what makes a metastatic cell be metastatic? If it's not a mutation, what properties are, how these cells are trained, where this information is, uh, is imprinted, and how we can use these properties to, to manipulate and handle metastatic disease. Um, people involved in this project, well, this is Sina Werf. This is, Sina was always like this, right? She was always had, she had this desk, plenty of journal. It was very, always a very messy desk. She was always reading. This was very annoying because <laughs> every time there was a new paper, you weren't to speak with her about this paper. She already read it. She was always reading paper early on. So this is the memory how I remember Sina sitting in her desk in her office. So uh, we really miss her, we really miss her. So after Sina passed away, I joined to Jerome Roos lab. We have been working together since then. And Another people involved here is Joanna Phillips, Marisa Daras, these people for the clinical uh, collections and uh, collecting clinical data. Students, students that have been working with me on, over these years. Uh, Matt Pitzer, we, who did the site of analysis. I didn't share this data today, but you can go to the paper and you can, you can take a look at those. It's very interesting what we saw there. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And we'll take any question you, you may have. Thank you a lot. That was a fantastic talk. Now it's time for questions. I think we already have uh, one. Mm -hmm. If I got it correct, that they want to ask live. Okay, maybe I misunderstood then. I, maybe I think I can start with the questions. Uh, you are commenting that there are two cell archetypes of metastatic uh, tumor cells, right? Mm -hmm. Would you expect that, I don't know, before the metastasis formation in those brain metastatic lesions that you cannot detect, there is any enrichment of those two different programs? Or would you expect that there is also a, the co-occurrence of both metaprograms? So, so basically you, you want to know if this, we can identify these metaprograms before the cancer cell, the tumor progress into metastasis? Exactly. If, what do you think about it? Yeah, yeah, no, no, that is a major question. So um, actually I have a slide for that. Uh, I was expecting this question. So basically the question here is, are these metaprograms or these archetypes something that we see in primary tumors or before the metastasis uh, progress into, right? So it's a very difficult to answer this question in human because to get, we, we should have much primary tumor and distant metastasis from the same patient. That is something that is, almost never happen. This, this is one exception that can be liver metastasis, but for this time metastasis primary tumor uh, is really challenging. So what we did here, we plot the top 30 gene for each metaprogram in public single cell data set in primary tumor. So we include multiple cancer in this slide, we're just showing three, it's breast cancer, lung cancer, and melanoma. And we can see, for example, that the P1, P2, that there's proliferation, they are present in all, that is expected actually. Also, um, protein synthesis, but the major difference, I have to say, they were in the detection of the, the co-expression of the genes associated with the P7, for example, you can see here. P7 is that program associated with ECM remodeling and EMT. So maybe uh, can be connected, right? So the, the activation of these EMT genes, the ability of the cancer cell to modify the ECM, that can be metastasis specific, uh, but we don't know because we don't have a match uh, sample. We, this is just a speculation. Also, we see a fragmented expression of genes of the program associated with inflammation. 
that is also have been some evidence connecting the increase of inflammatory genes with the progression of metastasis. So yeah, it's, it's not an easy question to answer, but I will say that if I have to put my attention in, in a couple of programs or archetypes, I will go to understand better how these ECM remodelings um, and inflammatory programs are connected and how these can actually make a difference between what is metastatic versus non-metastatic to finally allow the uh, metastatic formation. But this is not much prim primary tumors so have to be have to be cautious in these conclusions. Uh, thank you. Then I think Michelle Schulz also has a question. You can unmute yourself. Ah, now I can, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Hugo, for uh, your presentation. So indeed, I have uh, two kind of questions uh, in the direction of the mouse models and one for the human data. So um, from the mouse models, you showed us some immunofluorescence of the, of the uh, MDA and also the 41. Um, did you also compare it anyhow or did you like check because it looked to me that it was like really, really tiny metastasis or composing only a few a few hundred cells maybe. Um, did you check then also maybe in, in, in larger metastasis? Because I guess obviously one would expect, for example, yeah. much more macrophages or microglia or um, mm -hmm. some, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I know this because I, I have another project I have been working in this. I know these models very well. Um, so the one, one, one difference that these human metastases have with the experimental model is that in the experimental models, um, the cancer cell, they grow around the vessels. So this process, we call it co-option. So we don't see mm -hmm. solid tumor, we see branches of metastatic cell growing all around. All these metastases or the immunofluorescence that you saw, they are endpoints. So endpoints, so the, the mice, they are in the, they are just in the ethical uh, endpoint for this experiment. Um, so they are the bigger one that we can actually get. So we don't, we don't really have a massive metastasis. So we see regions with multiple branches of metastasis. That, that, is, that is equivalent to a big metastasis. Um, and no, we don't really see that much infiltration of immune cells in, in, in any of these, the, these models. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But also we have to understand that there is not a spontaneous model for brain metastasis. So that is something really important to say. We are, it's very artificial. We are injecting cells into the heart. So at the time for colonization is very short. In the, in the NDA in B231, depending on the number of cells, the endpoint is reached in five, six weeks. Still, it's, it's a short time. For the 41, it's around two to three weeks. You see? So there is, a, there is some factor that can explain why we don't really see that many immune infiltration. And about the microglia, if you take the whole brain, do the perco, you know, separation of the mononuclear cell and flow cytometry, yes, we see a significant increase of macrophages and myelo cells in the brain. But when you go to the section itself, we don't see those cells colocalizing with the metastatic cells. So, but it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of also from our lab um, uh, paper papers um, that we showed that, that in the mouse models um, we know that the microglia are really um, like really really early up on up on tumor cell contact like activated and also um, heavily heavily attracted to the outgrowing lesions. So, mm -hmm. I, I I mean, would have expected like from your models also like uh, more maybe you know more infiltration or, or activation of microglia, at least around. Yeah, so, so, so we, we really want to try with more models because um, I'm actually I'm working with people from, from other lab in their working primary tumor, but we are trying to select what could be the best model in terms of activation of the immune response. We really mm -hmm. were hunting for good models to the really induce an infiltration of immune cells, specific, specifically dendritic cells and T cells, because we know that in patient that is something that is present in most of the metastasis. And then we can really understand if we can reproduce this finding because we know that the infiltration of immune cells may be playing a major role in the way how the cancer cell colonize uh, later on. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, then a short second question. Sure. Um, short one, please. Sorry? A short one, please, because a I have two one. more. Uh, okay, 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 sorry. Um, so um, coming from the all the human single cell data, and um, was there any, I think as far as I recall it from your paper, it wasn't specifically mentioned, but did you saw in any analysis of the um, of the tumor cells, um, like any genes um, which might be related or which were constantly popping up in the tumor cells um, related to a neuronal signaling, neurotransmission, stuff like that because i think this is not like a particular yeah. program which you which yeah. you specify here um but i think which is also um, of high high interest in this regard I, I, I can i can tell you that yes but in the way how we design analysis is not there so let me explain you why because the strategy that we use for analysis was let's focus on what is common right when you focus on what is common we don't see a clear mm -hmm. signal for axon guidance or brain development genes. Now, if you go case by case, yes, you see some of those genes. What they are doing, we don't know because we don't really see that many neuron cells. So maybe these uh, mm -hmm. brain brain resident cells, this was a big discussion with the reviewer, right? Um, what happened with the brain resident cells in this trachytomic analysis? We are losing the cells in the dissociation on the hundreds of the samples. Uh, we did some staining for neurons. We didn't see that much neurons or oligodendrocyte infiltrated into the core of the tumor. So we see some astrocytes, right? So we don't see that many brain resident cells in these end stages brain metastasis. But probably early on, in the early stages of colonization, probably that interaction is very rich and maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is present there. Yeah. But I can okay. tell you, I can tell you, I really invite you to mine this data. I, I, I yeah. put all this data in, in Geo, and you're going to find the gene for sure, for sure. Yeah, I downloaded already the file. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, great, okay, so thank, there are, you. thank you. Uh, there are two questions more. I will read one from the chat from Abdallah Sheikha. Uh, he has a question. What could be the grounds of metastasis mouse models being colder than or human data? What could be the what? The, uh... the grounds, why is the metastasis of most models colder than the human data? I guess he's referring because of the inflammatory and stress pathways that don't attack. I know, I know. No, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Actually, I don't really have a, a valid answer for that question because I think it's more for the nature of the model itself. We know that the different mouse models, they have different kind of immune response. For example, the black six, they activate a higher, uh, inflammatory response compared with the BALC or the FBB mice. Um, so I think it's in part of the way how the immune system works in these models. And also, uh, I think it's a major factor is the, is the time of the experiment. That is a major factor too. Um, we don't have any model for spontaneous brain metastasis. But we also have a we don't have good models for a spontaneous bone metastasis or liver metastasis. The only spontaneous metastasis that we can study in mice is lymph node and lung. That is that is very well uh, described. The other ones is, is much more tricky. So we need to do this kind of very artificial system, injecting cells in the heart, or um, intracranial injections, or, or inter interliver expression uh, injection, and the mice they reach the endpoint in a few weeks. And the immune system maybe need months to really activate in the way how we see in patients. That can be one of the reasons, but, but I'm just speculating here. Uh, okay, it's, and a, it's, a, it's a big challenge, it's a big challenge, it's a big challenge. Any good model that they can reproduce better the interaction, the interface between cancer cells or metastatic cells in our case, and the immune response is, is a step forward for sure. I guess so. And uh, now we have, I think, the last question because we, we are a bit ahead of time. Coming from Eugenio. Hi, Hugo. Great presentation. Um, so my question would be: uh, So you have these two cell archetypes that are coexisting in the brain metastasis, and I was um, uh, I was thinking of if you could correlate the uh, if you if you have done analysis on the blood of those patients that have brain metastasis and if you could correlate the you know, the phenotype of the blood cells in the periphery with the phenotype within the uh the tumor the, the brain tumor it's, it's an amazing question very challenging too sadly uh the problem with that question is also with that experiment is getting enough cell from blood 
So enough metastatic cell from blood to compare. And actually, in my knowledge, there is just one paper that they succeed in that, collecting CTCs from circulating tumor cells from breast cancer patients. And I can tell you that the number of cells that they can collect is like a handle sample. So in some patients, they have five cells, 20 cells, right? So it's really, really challenging. We should have a lot of blood to really get that number of cells. We have the blood for all these patients. We didn't include in the study, but we have the blood. And I can tell you that it's really, really challenging. And I would love to do that. I would love to do that. In mice, it's different because in mice, you can really see a lot of cancer cells moving around. In patient, it, it, it is not the case. It's not the case, sadly. Thank but you. This is a good thing to do. I'm totally, yeah. One, one of the other questions that they, usually they ask me is if I can get a specific signature that define all these two archetypes and then go to the primary tumor to find the cell of in origin, right? So if there is a metastatic, if the metastatic cells acquire these metastatic traits in the primary tumor or these cancer cells, they are being trained during the process, during the metastatic cascade to finally reach this archetype. It's part of what we are doing now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot to both the speakers, to both Dr. Matriz Blanco Redondo and Dr. Hugo Gonzalez Veloso for both fantastic talks. Thank you for accepting the invitation and thank you, thank you all for coming here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me. And just before we go, I would like to invite you to our next seminar on April 21 regarding regulation and features of reactive astrocytes. So yes, we are uh, hopefully to see you there. Follow our social networks and thank you, Anna. Thank you, Beatriz. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here and congratulations. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.